Uh, I'm Dr. Thomas Moink, uh, California Cranial Institute, Los Gatos, California. I integrate cranial therapies with orthodontics and dentistry. Uh, we treat a lot of strange neurological cases. That's our forte. That's what we love. And uh, these two cases came in in the last year. I want to thank Charles first because uh, we've had uh, eight papers at five conferences in the last 13 months together. And I've been running all over the world. and. This is my last conference for a little while. I'm not going anywhere after this for a little while. I gotta get to take two weeks off. Thank you. Um, but these cases, these uh, two papers were originally presented at the COCA conference in uh, Melbourne, Australia in October. And they're both visual cases um, involving the visual system. So the first one is diplopia. Uh, I'm gonna just talk this out because I know this case inside out. Um, the patient came in uh, approximately 59 years old, male, he had a history of 30 years of rubbing his eyes every morning upon waking. He felt funny and then the eyes would straighten out, he was fine. Until one day he woke up and his left eye was deviating up vertically and he developed a vertical diplopia from a fourth cranial nerve palsy. He came into me and I diagnosed him as a category one right he was a left temporal and extension cranial fault at the same time. He was a heavy clencher. He had a maxillary deficiency, meaning when he hit his teeth, he had a hard contact in the front. Both of these cases are very similar that way. He had an incredible amount of bone growth at the, around the maxilla, so he'd obviously been doing this for years. And immediately we started to treat him. I sent him the dentist on the case, and I can say the name was Dr. Nicole Pagonas, who's an amazing dentist, uh, two blocks in my office. And we had her fabricate a lower flat plane occlusal splint, no anterior contact in the incisors, perfect equilibration. I treated him uh, once a week, three weeks in a row. Overall treatment was six treatments. Five treatments really completed the case. I did a six treatment as a follow-up. Um, he completely resolved. Uh, this case is, uh, I think, about 18 months old now. He's still fine. He doesn't come in. I called him on the phone. He says, I'm fine. I don't need to come in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the hallmark of the case is the amount of clenching the trauma. And he was waking up for 30 years in the morning with this. This had been going on and developing. Okay? And uh, he would just kind of arouse himself out of it every... Uh, every morning until that was that one day that uh, you went over the edge and you're done. All right. This case I found way more interesting. Uh, unfortunate lady, really nice lady, under a lot of stress in her life, 47 years old, uh, dealt with uh, some definite stress in the family, uh, a stepchild who going through a lot of issues. Uh, long history of clenching too. She wore hearing aids. So she definitely had issues and had issues going on. Um, woke up one morning, all of a sudden she's no vision in the right eye for two hours. And then it comes back. And this actually went on for six months. Um, I, this paper, we don't have this paper exactly accurately written here, but um, so I'm filling in more of the details. But it went on for six months. And uh, this is accompanied by deep pain in the eye, flashing lights. Uh, she also had migraine headaches. She had neck problems and other, uh, yeah, a long history, a long list of complaints, put it that way, and a lot on her plate at the same time. Uh, she was diagnosed with orbital pseudotumor. That's 10% of all orbital diseases, the third leading uh, orbital disease. So this turns out to be relatively common, which is interesting. We don't hear anything about this, this kind of problem. Uh, but they're out there, and there's virtually no treatment. You can do corticosteroids. Some people have tried some pretty invasive surgeries uh, with, I don't think, very good results because they don't really do it. She was told to just sit back and watch it. That's it. Uh, came in, did the assessment. She was a right occiput in extension. She was a right category one. Uh, she had a heavy interference pattern in the front of the bite. She was a heavy clencher. Um, hearing aids, like I said, she had a long, long history of, of, uh, of hearing problems. So 
basic procedure, started to treat her, got her into the dentist right away. We don't do a workup where we treat them and try to get the cranium all balanced and work with them for weeks and months and then go to a splint. In cases like this, I'll work with them, I'll get them opened up, I'll start to balance the system, we'll get them right into the dentist, we'll do a, a um, impression and then get something in as fast as we can because the faster I can get something in there and unload that bite, especially the anterior bite going through the facial structure and into the orbit, the better off I'm going to be and then I can balance the structure. She was approximately a six week case. I saw her, uh, oh, I saw her last week for the first time since December and she's still fine. She went uh, asymptomatic after six weeks and uh, she's doing quite well. Uh, she still has a lot of stress in her life, but she's able to manage it now. Um, we talk about all the structural stresses that go through the, this face. We have to really take into account all the inaccessible sutures. Um, I recommend that people look at Mark Pick's book, Suture, the Sutural book, which is amazing, and see the connections of these inaccessible sutures. These are the ones you don't think of. And there's a lot going on in this facial structure. And when we put those kinds of forces through it and look into an orbit, and we look at the floor of the orbit, and we look at the maxilla, and then we come around lateral to the zygomatic, and then we come to the ethmoid portion, and then there's a sphenoid portion, there's a frontal portion. There's a lot going on in the orbit, a lot of room to maneuver, a lot of compression that can happen. Um, I've treated cases of serous retinopathy successfully. I had, uh, with one eye doctor I work with, we were getting 20 and 30 or 40 percent reductions in eye pressure in glaucoma patients after three or four treatments as measured in, 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 um, in their offices. So there's a lot of work that we can do in this field. Uh, I think the hallmark of both these cases, though, was unloading that facial structure, getting the trauma off first, so then we could take care of the underlying drama and get it resolved and get it back to healing. So, thank you. <laughs> How do we know as practitioners when we should really be sending a patient to an orthodontist um, to, to get work done? At, at what point during their care plan? You know, should it be in the beginning? Oh, wow, they definitely have this kind of occlusion or that kind. This is going to be someone who I'm only going to work with a few times and then send them off. Like, how, do, how do we know? By function and disability, if, if there's a patient that has a lot of neurological deficits, if they have a major TMJ problem, uh, they have a cervical disc problem, I mean, they're going to have a level of dysfunction that if you go and start putting orthodontic wires on them and lock up the cranium, you're going to get a bad reaction. Anytime you use ortho, you're going to lock up the cranium. Yeah, you can manage that in a patient that has some type of reserve capacity. But if you've taken someone that doesn't have any reserve capacity left, those people we would take, put a lower mouth guard in for a year. Get them asymptomatic for a year. I don't have any more vertigo. I don't have my migraines. My TMJ, you know, the joint function is fine. Then we go, okay, good. Then you can do ortho. So, and that's, that's where you've got to be careful, exactly. Because you can exacerbate all that stuff just doing orthodontics. And a good orthodontics will say, you know what, let's hold and wait and do it later. And there's too many people who are willing to just jump in, and that's where you get into trouble. So when in doubt, go slow. Thank you.